Um, and now for the big event, the reason we're all here, I would like to have uh, one of the graduate student workers we have in the C&D lab. Her name is Julie Swenson. She works at the Bush School. And um, she's going to invite our, our, our introduce our speaker for the, for the day. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you all could make it out. And I'm excited to introduce Wenzhen Chen. She is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management here at Texas A&M University. Um, she, her dissertation focuses on climate change and adaptive activities impacts on grain and livestock output, as well as rural household income in Inner Mongolia, China. Her bachelor's degree is in Economic Information Management from Communication University of China, and she has a master's degree in Communication from Peking University. Before she joined Texas A&M University, she worked three years in rural development, serving as program manager in poverty reduction for China Rural Technology Development Center, which is in the Ministry of Science and Technology in China. This summer, she also attended the Borlaug Summer Institute on Global Food Security. We're excited to have her speaking to us with us today. Thank you. Wherever you'd like. Okay. Um, thank you, Julie. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to share my research ideas with all of you. And um, today, actually, I'm going to share one of the three articles in my presentation. And this is not my final draft. So if you have any comments, suggestions, criticisms, please don't hesitate. Okay. Um, so uh, just give you a little bit of outline. First of all, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of my presentation. And then uh, we're going to narrow it down to the article that we're going to talk about, uh, introduction to the research area, uh, research objectives, hypothesis, and then how did I design and implement it, my research. Uh, at last, I will briefly uh, present the results and a short discussion. Okay, um, so my dissertation interest lies in the global dry lines. And just to uh, give you a visual of what's global dry lines. So in this map, uh, okay, all of those uh, yellowish areas. Let's see if I can turn the lights so you can see better. Okay. Is that okay? Better? Okay. So all of this yellowish area uh, are categorized as global dry lines by United Nations Environment Program. So what is dry lines? Uh, it's actually a land, uh, a land system with aridity in this, uh, index less than 0.65. And what is aridity index? Um, it's actually the ratio of precipitation and uh, evapotranspiration. So basically, this measures how much water you gain each year and how much of this water actually get out of your system. So as you can see, there's so much, such a vast area in this world is covered by global dry lines. Actually, it accounts for it accounts for 40% of the world uh, land area. It supports one third of the world population, and 90% of them are in developing countries. These areas, if you uh, think back to the map are mostly remote, isolated, and facing water stress. And one of the major challenges global dwellings are facing nowadays is land degradation and desertification. So what does desertification do? Well, uh, apparently, um, <coughs> the most, uh, I would say the most evil things <laughs> it could do uh, the most obvious thing is sandstorms. It can cover uh, the cropland. It can uh, interrupt the transportation system. 
it can also pull the environment. Well, it, but with desertification, the soil organic matters uh, drop down, and there's with soil erosion, erosion um, agricultural productive, productivity was significantly reduced. For example, based on United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, um, it says grassland productivity could drop by 49 to 90 percent due to desertification. And in a lot of those uh, drylands countries, desertification actually caused Four to eight percent of their annual GDP. So, climate change can actually ex uh, exacerbate desertification. But how? Well, first of all, some uh, drought, flood, or fire, or extreme events like this could uh, induce soil erosion. And so erosion would reduce the plant coverage uh, on dry land. And then once the plant coverage is reduced, it will get back, it will lead to uh, desertification. And it's kind of like a very bad circle. Uh, and also, uh, and so event, uh, in case you don't know, during the, um, for example, in Australia, uh, in some of those deserts, during the La Nina phase, there will be a lot of uh, precipitation. And then, because of the pre precipitation, the fuel load, uh, which means dry, uh, dry materials, dry plant materials, will increase, accumulate to a very large uh, amount. Then during the um, El Nino state, Wildfire, a strong wildfire could happen and burn down, just wipe out the whole uh, the whole area, which leads to very serious, uh, even serious desertification. So um, my research, uh, because I'm from China, and <laughs> so I choose one specific dryland area in China as my research area. Um, you could, as you can see. Uh, marked in blue, which is Inner Mongolia. Okay, so uh, apparently Inner Mongolia, as a typical dwelling, also face, faces very serious land degradation. Actually, in the last 50 years, the land degradation rate is 2% per year. Uh, in 1999, 60% of the range land in Inner Mongolia is was degraded, but back in 1990, only 10 years ago, it was only 40 percent. And this is one of the uh, bad impacts that uh, desertification caused in China. Um, all of these two pictures are uh, shot in Beijing this year, earlier May, um, because there are several deserts or sandlands in Inner Mongolia. So each year there will, in every spring, there will be huge, huge sandstorms that blows to not only Beijing, but also uh, other areas of China, Russia, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, even sometimes in California. And land degradation in Inner Mongolia has led very, uh, very serious economic loss including direct damage, environment pollution, land loss, salt nutrients loss, decreased carrying capacity of rangeland, lower the plant productivity. And as some researcher estimated in 2005, the pure loss due the pure economic loss due to desertification in Inner Mongolia is 4.28 billion US dollars. So we have a, a setting that facing desertification and also climate change. And on the uh, on the other hand <coughs> on the other hand, this area also faces rapid 
economic, social economic changes, including population growth, overstocking, land use change, especially converting rangeland to croplands. And well, uh, together with this, are the immig Han immigrants to Inner Mongolia, and also um, sedimentation of herders since uh, before they kind of had a grazing uh, herding system, but now they kind of settle down. Uh, together, coming with this is fencing of rangeland. All of these factors, as a lot of researchers have proposed, also contribute to land degradation. So uh, my research policy includes the role of climate change and adaptation activities in the development of different agriculture sectors in Inner Mongolia. Uh, to be specific, includes the grain production sector and livestock production sector. And also the impacts of environmental and socioeconomic factors on rural livelihoods in the study region. And to be specific, is those impacts on rural income. So this is the structure of my dissertation. It includes three articles. The first one is uh, climate and adapt adaptation impacts on grain production, grain output value. Mm -hmm. The second one is those impacts on the livestock production. These two research are all um, based on a county level secondary data that I collected from the Chinese government authorities. Um, they are all panel data with a nine years time period. And my third article is based on a field survey that I conducted in 2010. Um, it's focused on the environmental and social impact uh, on household income. OK, so let's focus on Article 3. Um, this is my research area, right in the middle of Inner Mongolia. Um, I would say that. Um, in the south area, a lot of um, the rural residents are farmers. Well, but as we moving northwards, more and more of them are becoming uh, livestock losers. And here, um, this is a house spot in China. It's called uh, is the sandland called Hunshan Da Ke, which is only 180 kilometers to Beijing, and is considered uh, one of the main uh, sandstorm source to Beijing. OK, so my objectives apparently uh, examine the relationships among rural household income and these social economic factors, including environmental conditions, uh, diversification of livelihoods, education level, technical support, market access, occupation, and ethnicity. So, um, you know, pairing each of those objectives, I have seven research hypotheses here. So basically, I think the number of income source is positively related to uh, the household net per capita income. Um, technical support also positively correlated. Mm, education percentage of family members with education level of primary or below is negatively correlated. <coughs> Uh, it's negatively correlated to household income. And then I, I, uh, I suppose there must be significantly different in income between um, household 
has market access. In this case, with access to company purchase and those that has not. Also, um, between different agriculture and non-agriculture sectors, uh, between different ethnic groups and households in different land degradation level uh, areas, I suppose they have significantly different income. <clears throat> okay, <coughs> so how I design my research. Basically, um, actually I use a very simple model. It's a mul uh, multiple regression model. Uh, this is the I represent the night protected income. Here, the um, <coughs> independent variables, including those that we have mentioned in the research hypothesis, and also um, basic factors such as uh, population and mm, <coughs> the land area and uh, ship unit, um, which means um, how many ship equivalent the household have. And also, um, if the households have uh, crops, vegetables, or trees. Now, uh, so my research design was um, looking into uh, Sinigor area. There are 12 counties in that area. So I, in these 12 counties, I divide them into three groups based on land degradation level. And then in each group, I select one county. In one, each county, <coughs> I select two to four villages. And then um, in those villages, I randomly select household to interview. And so my instrumentation <coughs> is questionnaire and face-to-face -face interview. Okay, so um, these are the land degradation level, actually a uh, heavy degradation level mm. of the twelve of the twelve counties uh, in Chilingor in two thousand three. Well, you can see thirteen of them here because Ulaga is <laughs> actually a part of this uh, Dong Wu Jung uh, County. So, but they're all in the, I, I call them the first category. They um, very light degraded. And then uh, basically they're under 5%. And then the second group is from 10% to 20%. The third group is more than 20%. So this is the these are the counties that I chose. Um, number one is the um, lightest degraded, um, which is called Tai Fu Si County. Uh, number two is Xilin County, um, is mid level degradation. Uh, number three is with heavy degradation, uh, which is called Zhenglan Banner. Uh, in in Mongolian, uh, Banner also means Okay, so in the summer of 2010, I did the field survey, and these are the household distribution uh, in these three counties. As you can see, the total number of households is 189. And here are some uh, pictures <laughs> during the field research. Um, Oh, um, I think I have to uh, emphasize here that actually in in this setting there are altogether three types of rural residents. One of them, uh, one type of uh, farmers, but they basically grow plants and vegetables. Second type, second type are um, livestock raisers. Uh, they actually very much focus on livestock. They don't uh, usually they don't have any uh, green or crop land. And the third type is 
I, I call them ecological migrants because they were previously they were uh, livestock grazers. However, because of the rangeland degradation, they had to be um, moved or evacuated out of their own uh, villages or township and live in a, how should I say, a, a man-made or actually the government made a new village uh, near the city just for those uh, migrants. So, but those people still have their land back in the village. They can, um, but they cannot uh, graze on it. They can cut. They can cut the grass at the end of the, um, actually in fall, uh, or they can just rent the land uh, to somebody, but um, with some limitations on the usage. Okay, so. <laughs> This is actually one of those uh, the migrants' village that uh, we visited, and this is the um, I'm interviewing farmers group. Uh, you can see he is actually selling uh, cabbage. Um, <laughs> here is a very typical uh, land, livestock raisers' uh, home behind me. Actually, this is a wall. Uh, made of cow dung. They, um, they kind of use that to build walls and they also burn it uh, in the winter. And this is some grain production uh, during the research, uh, in the research area. Okay, and these are the, uh, some of the interview pictures. And um, usually if you go to the Mongolian household, they will give you uh, milk tea and some treats. And, uh, this is one of my research assistants. Uh, actually, she is here. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank her. Uh, her name is Xiao Xiao. Uh, she's my sister. She's also a student <laughs> at Bush School right now. <laughs> okay. okay, so now let's uh, quickly go over the results. Let's see some of the descriptive results. It's uh, shocking that, well, to me, it was shocking that the mean income was um, minus 61 yuan. Uh, keep in mind, um, one yuan, one Chinese yuan, approximately equal to six. No, no, no. Uh, the other way, one U.S. dollar equal to six yuan. So, like the mean income is minus ten yuan, ten dollars. But there's this. But it has a huge range, like from, let's say, uh, 200, minus $200 to um, $3,000. And then, remember, we, we had the hypothesis that between farmers group, farmers group, land degradation groups, and uh, ethnic groups, we hypothesized that there must be significant difference. Well, if we if we just eyeball them, there are huge difference because the Han households um, had an income of more than two thousand, but the minority, well, the minority household mainly just uh, Mongolian household. I think in my research, uh, in in those household I interviewed, mm, probably. Only two or three of them mm, are uh, Hui or other minority groups, but otherwise they all Mongolians. So we see huge difference between ethnic groups and huge difference between different um, land degradation groups, and also farmers apparently <coughs> had the highest income. Uh, livestock losers and migrators were all losers in that specific year. Yes? Since your net per capita income, mean net per capita income is negative, uh, can you describe how did you calculate that net per capita income? Yes. <coughs> Actually, uh, I asked them, like, um, what is the net per capita? 
what is the net income per household uh, in last year, which is year 2009. So um, that's how I record it. And, uh, Didn't they explain mm -hmm. why do they have so many negative? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, we're going to discuss that later. But thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Here, um, this is some descriptions of those uh, independent variables uh, with their unit of measurement, measurement and mean or frequency. Um, I just want to um, single out several, several, uh, for example, the um, ship unit, which we all care about, like. Uh, av an average household has high 108 ship units for equivalent ship. And also, um, the, uh, oh, I want to show this. The income, the number of income sources, the average 2.3, which means most of the household only has two sorts of incomes, like maybe farming and some off-farm off labor or wage work. And now let's jump to this uh, final regression result. Mm. So altogether, I found five uh, variables had significant uh, association with the per capita net income, including Income source number, well, as you can see, if we hold everything else constant, one income source number is associated with, uh, is associated with 1,000 RMB increase in, uh, uh, in income. And vegetable dummy, well, those uh, households who planted vegetables had income that like more than 4,000 uh, yuan higher than those households that did not have vegetables. And then the land, the, the group in the low land degradation area had significantly more income than those that are not. And then uh, company purchase, those households has uh, market assets through selling their um, product to those companies also has like has a significant more income and this is the then of course basic inputs like land area but the uh, coefficient is not as high as as we expected um, so um, pretty much this is the regression result uh, I want to uh, well, based on this result, let's go back to my research hypothesis. <coughs> so number of income source is certainly positively correlated to household and net per capita income. And a number of technical supports gained. Um, I didn't find any significant association. Uh, for the education, I didn't find any significant uh, results. Uh, for um, household with access to company purchase and does not, there was significant difference. For uh, different agriculture and non agriculture sectors, which means farmer, uh, livestock raiser, and also uh, ecological migrants, I didn't see significant difference. And um, for those uh, different ethnic groups, well, although we saw differences in, in our graph, but in this model, it doesn't have a significant difference. And last, the land degradation um, really played a, a significant role in, I should say the land degradation level uh, is significantly associated with the income level. Now, let's have a brief discussion. Well, back to my... Uh, research hypothesis, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in finding out why five and six um, 
did not happen in my research because if we go back to that uh, graph, we did see uh, amazing differences. So um, I want to uh, explore it a little bit more. So talk about the ethnic groups. We see the difference, uh, like more than 4,000 RMB, but if we look into um, look into the details about the Han household and minority household, we can see that most of the Han household working on the farming sector, but most of the minority households work on the grazing sector or livestock sector. So um, it's actually uh, probably this difference is due to the sectoral difference. If I say that, okay, Han has significantly uh, more income than the minorities, but probably we, um, it's not, we should say instead that actually farmers has significantly more income than those non-farmers because see here, uh, this difference is 9,000 if we add up, and um, this difference is nearly 10,000 RMB. So, um, but a farmer, this indicator didn't show significantly in my result either. So I want to uh, keep looking <laughs> on this. So I did a three-way ANOVA test. I found, okay, so I put uh, the dependent variable is still income. The independent variable including um, the ethnic groups, uh, county new here represent the land degradation level groups. And farmer is um, whether the, uh, um, the the household is farmer or non-farmer. I collapse the um, migrants and uh, uh, livestock reserve group because uh, first of all. The migrants were livestock raisers. Most of them still have livestock. Uh, secondly, uh, the sale, uh, the number in the uh, sale of, um, of the migrators are too small. So uh, I kind of had, had to collapse them. So here I didn't really find any significant result. Oh, actually I did. I found significant result. On farmer, like, um, but why uh, it didn't show in my result? Well, if we think think back, uh, actually another variable showed is called a uh, vegetable dummy, like whether the household grow vegetable or not. So I look into the farmers group and um, compare the farmers who grow vegetable and the farmers who don't. And then I saw a significant uh, significant difference with a p-value less than uh, 0 0.001. So basically, the farmers only grow uh, green crops, have like only well, less than uh, about 100 US dollars. But those with uh, those grow vegetables has about 1,000 US dollars. This is a huge difference. Um, so um, I then I took out the vegetable <laughs> growers and then I recompare um, among the occupations, which means uh, farming, uh, livestock raising, and also migrating group. And then I didn't find a significant difference through ANOVA test. So. Um, I guess then uh, that gentleman asked me earlier why those households had uh, a lot of negative income. If we look back in the <coughs> photos, we could remember those households uh, most uh, livestock lizards. And uh, the article one and two of my dissertation had a um, nine years data on livestock production in Mongolia. Well, it, in that set of data, it was not a norm that you know the uh, uh, the livestock raisers kept looking uh, kept 
losing money. Um, so why this happened? So I looked uh, back into the um, uh, weather condition uh, back in 2009. Then I found that um, in May there was a severe drought. Um, uh, as you know, May is the season that the grass started growing. And then because of the drought, the grass could not grow out in time. And then uh, there's, there was low coverage of uh, irrigation facilities, especially for those uh, livestock grazers. The rangeland, like most of the rangeland uh, we visited, had no irrigation facilities. But even for those uh, farmers, the, the crop growers, we don't really see much uh, irrigation facilities except those vegetable growers. They all equipped with uh, irrigation. And then there was a cold. There was actually three cold waves in the winter of 2009 uh, accompanied by precipitation. Precipi uh, event, which in, uh, in that case, very heavy snow. So the snow covered the grass, um, and then um, the low temperature froze the snow. So when the uh, livestock went up to graze, they could not really uh, reach the grass. So that's why, uh, and, uh, and that's why uh, a lot of the livestock uh, Raisers lost money in 2009, and um, this also was confirmed during our interview with uh, the households. Okay, so uh, let's take a quick look at the vegetable growers. They, since they are the big winner in this uh, in this analysis, um, because if they do cash crop, uh, well equipped with irrigation. Um, they have good market access because um, usually what they produced uh, immediately there would be small companies or vendors uh, came to their village to buy their vegetables and they have a uh, very sustainable, uh, very, very stable relationship with those uh, companies uh, and they have the best land in, the, in these three groups because they are the uh, least degraded. Uh, but is this sustainable or is this uh, this form could be used uh, for other areas in Inner Mongolia? Just remember these are in, the, in South Mongolia, but as we move moving north, more and more of them are uh, uh, Mongolians. They do uh, livestock raising for generations. So this is um, under discussion, I would say. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about just a little bit of diversification of the income sources. Because as we remember, the income sources in, in, in the uh, sample, the average is 2.3, very limited. But Based on a lot of research, diversification of income source really helped the uh, household with their income level, and also it helped them um, to uh, have this uh, security systems against the failure uh, in the farming sector. So, um, but regarding um, how diversification could happen or facilitate. There are a lot of determinants, including the cost benefit, uh, land accessibility, or rural road, or education. Um, yeah. But oh, you know, I think uh, diversification of the income source should definitely be uh, encouraged in order to secure the um, household income in the research area. And uh, so implications, uh, as we could see, stable crop farming generate very limited income. Animal husbandry is extremely vulnerable to unfavorable uh, weather conditions. Water stress put limits to local agriculture production. And cash crop 
generous significant income for rural households. Diversification is needed, but uh, at the same time, the su sustainability issue should be considered. Um, uh, last but not least, access to market plays an important role in securing rural income. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much my, <laughs> uh, my third piece. Thank you. And uh, please comment, criticism, and questions. Do you have any? Yes, we have time for questions. I'd just like to go back to the question the gentleman asked over there. I don't understand your negative income. Uh, oh. What explains negative income? Oh, because, um, yeah, I think I should. Uh, so, because of these natural conditions, a lot of uh, cattle didn't have enough. Um, at the spring, uh, they didn't have enough food. So, but then what worsened it was in winter, they couldn't have food. So, a lot of cattle actually died just because they didn't have enough food. So did you calculate the income from what sales they had less the cost of maintaining the animals? Um, well, actually, the farmer says they didn't have income to buy enough feed because uh, in a lot of my uh, interviewed household, they could spend 7,000 yuan, 8,000 yuan to buy just by feed, and they they just couldn't afford it. That's how they said, how they put it. The thing is, how did they buy any food or anything if they don't have any income? Um, well, I guess there is priority between human food and animal food. Yeah. I'd like to validate the negative income you have uh, current evidence from our Africa surveys that income actually can be negative if you take their own labor into consideration. So if, if you're calculating the value of their own labor, it's possible that they're buying food or they're subsistence level farmers, so they're eating what they're producing. But if you factor in their own uh, labor cost and the cost of other things, seeds and all that, sometimes the income can be negative because these poor farmers are mainly subsisting the farmers. So that's possible. However, um, again, uh, the question would arise that how was the income calculated? So mm -hmm. it would be good when you put it put it in for publication if you put in how, why the negative income and how you calculate or how the farmer calculates things. Yeah, well, I would, uh, yeah, I want to add this. That, uh, actually, during the interview, we just kind of asked them how much you made last year and how much you spent. Basically, I don't think they uh, calculated their labor in this equation. But also, um, about that, the question was food. Uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, in good years, the livestock raisers could gain a lot, a lot of money. And so in general, if there is a good year, they're so much better off than those farmers or vegetable growers. So they have savings. And um, yeah. And also, um, I guess, um, well, there are some research on the uh, economic pressure that in the Mongolia are facing because um, supporting so many uh, livestock, like giving the uh, metro system so much pressure. Actually, uh, plus, not all the farmers have access to proper technology to raise the livestock. So it's kind of like in a bad year, and it's, it doesn't really worth it to buy feed than just let them you know, be. Well, I, I think another example would be in Texas, several years ago, a lot of horses just, uh, the horse owners just let their horses be, or they, they, they can't, they couldn't even let them kill because if you kill a horse, there's a certain amount of charge. So a lot of horses died uh, during the drought. So 
I think there's similar. I, I think you have to be careful. Uh, there's a difference between income and asset loss. Okay. If, you, if your costs exceed your income, then you have a negative where well, you're losing money, right? But your assets, you have to probably consider those differently. You, you've got a lot of loss in assets, but that may or may not affect your income in a given year. Over time, it can, because your productive capacity goes down. Yes, I, I guess. Um, so, I'm not sure if they. Uh, I, I don't think they accounted for. They accounted. They counted the asset loss in in terms of animal death. But they they just counted how much I spent on feed on, on the maintenance of my rangeland and how much I gain. Pretty much, I think. For those livestock wizards, uh, in 2009, they just purely spent money and they didn't get any back. Yeah, uh, can you tell us more about the adaptive activities or the adaptation component of your research? Yeah. Sure. Um, let's see. OK, I'll just talk. So uh, my, um, adaptive, uh, my research component on adaptive activity, uh, mainly focus on those activities that could both uh, actually could increase the adaptive capacity, which means those activities that make farmers more uh, capable facing <coughs> different conditions and or, or make them more flexible uh, under climate change or, or social change. So in my research is include uh, education uh, because education can teach a person um, to know like you're under certain circumstances what choice, what's the best choice they can make. And uh, education could also, uh, let's see, uh, education could also Make them more, uh, make more, make technology more approachable to them, or well, reasons like this. So education and length of habit, uh, as we talked about, um, when you talk about diversification, actually road is very important because uh, if you want a job in the nearby city, you don't have good road, you cannot go there, and without road. The transportation of uh, uh, production materials and also your products are very difficult. So this is the second component, and also I have um, diversification of uh, agricultural producer, uh, agriculture sector, uh, because in Article One, Two, I what I care about is the product of gr uh, productivity of grain and also a livestock. So because, uh, as we talk about, if you focus on just one, uh, probably just one product, it's very risky. So diversification kind of provided security uh, to it. And also, I have um, technical assistance or technical support. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the uh, factors that. Um, Just a little follow up. So, uh, did you account statistically or in the quantitative analysis the mediation factor of these uh, adaptation strategies as they were a response to the original sources of pressure to the um, farmer? So, they by mediation factors. Yeah, like what this. Was Originally, it was the temperature and the precipitation oh, yeah. that pushed their income or their livelihood to stress, and then they responded adapting. So mm -hmm. they come like in different levels. You mean something like a path analysis? Mm -hmm. No, I, I didn't. Actually, uh, <laughs> because my data is panel data, so um, I still use the multiple regression approach, but I include both the climate factors, which is uh, precipitation and uh, temperature, and also those <coughs> those adaptive uh, 
activity factors that I talked about. Yeah, but also the basic uh, input factors like land, labor. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. A study like this, where you are studying impact of environment on income and so on, is one year data good enough to draw conclusions uh, that environment changes and in dry land it changes more than in the environmental area? Uh, so that's one question. Second, Second one is, if I remember correctly, one of your tables, the mean was 600 something, mm -hmm. but the standard deviation was 2400. Mm -hmm. uh, the standard error was even more than mean. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether you took all the data together or how did you do that. And the third one is, is government doing something for development of this area? Is what? Is government, government. Okay. Yeah, government yeah. doing something yeah. to help me. Okay, so uh, for first question? Yeah. Yeah, for the first question, I'll say, no, it's not. So that is why I have Article 1 and 2 to have a nine years continuous data um, on this issue. But um, I wanted to do a field survey because, first of all, uh, the panel data approach, like the data I got is from the government. So, um, and it's secondary. Um, so I wanted some first-hand data and also um, related to like household or the people that I can see because the, the article 1 and 2 are on county level so it's like uh, um, in case you do know counties in China it's just like small cities in, China, in, in the US so I would say no uh, but this gives some give you a glance and also some insights on what happened in that area, like we discussed. Secondly, um, let's go to that table. I think that's the. Um, can you identify the table if we. The this end. one? Not toward the end, but the big table. Where you are trying toward the, keep going, towards the end. Towards the end? the last big table. Yeah, this one. This one? No, there was another one, more, more than this. But take the other one as an example. That that one was this one? Yeah, the so mean is that much, standard deviation is that much, and standard is more than that. So I'm just asking whether all your study thing was one sample, that you have such a large variation and the mean is small. Normally, that kind of thing is not expected in a you have taken random sample from a big uh, Well, I think that's because, uh, as we discussed, our, um, I would say our household is very diverse. But also, if you look into the standard deviation, like, I don't know, plus one to the right, minus one to the left. Well, that's why I need a t-test to see if there is statistically significant difference. No, no, you know what I'm saying? Is standard deviation of 1007 and mean is only 547 means your know, mean is very small, the values were small, and this, the variation was so large. So, normally that kind of thing means that you, your population, you didn't take random samples, maybe it was extreme kind of a thing that you have, where the mean, is, normally mean should not be smaller than standard deviation. In a normal, in a normal situation. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, mean, that's I would look into that, but um, <coughs> I think that's one of the characteristics of my sample. Um, and as we could see through this uh, this article, we it's, there's a lot of discrepancies, a lot a large discrepancy between the household. And thirdly, yeah, actually the government is doing something. Uh, actually, I also. Uh, in this model, I also incorporate the uh, environment protection programs. Like, uh, one of the variables is how many programs are you attending. Uh, but of course, the government is doing more. Um, like we said, uh, like we mentioned earlier, the earlier conversion of rangeland to cropland, um, sedimentation of household, 
advancing a grass line um, are all well, mostly initiated by the government. Yeah. Just a comment. I certainly think that this is a very rich area for doing research. It's reading last month's uh, Science Magazine, and they have a very strong piece on food security and climate change, and how climate change is uh, uh, making food security worse around the world, especially in developing countries. So I think uh, you can go into this, and this is a very germane area of research. And thank you very much for presenting. Thank you. Us. Um, I'll keep working on this if I can get funding. <laughs> yeah, so great job. Thank you so much. And again, if anyone has questions about big ideas, come see me. Check out the website. I'm going to have a lot more coming out about this. And then our next event is October 2nd. So anyone who wants to learn how to geocode, uh, if anyone wants to learn how to geocode or wants to learn about terrorism, it should be a great lecture by Dr. Mike Finley. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.